and go. Hello and welcome everyone to this panel during this important climate week. Tomorrow marks the fifth anniversary of the Paris Agreement and today, basically literally as we speak, the European um, Council summit is happening and they're negotiating the climate law, which is at the heart of the European Green Deal, the flagship project of the von der Leyen Commission. My name is Lisa Tostado and I'm speaking to you from Paris today, um, the city that has become so symbolic in the climate community. But I'm usually based in Brussels, where I work for the Heinrich Böll Foundation. That is the Green German political foundation that is affiliated with the Green Party that is represented in Germany's parliament. And today we're getting together to discuss where we are at with respect to climate action five years after this important climate accord. We will debate the geopolitical aspects of climate negotiations, but also the social impacts of climate policies themselves on different levels of government. And we will reflect on how we can actually get on a pathway that is compatible with the 1.5 um, degrees objective that was outlined in the Paris Agreement. This web conference is being translated simultaneously into French and Spanish. So on the bottom um, of the live stream, there is a small uh, globe button on the right hand side of the red dot with live. So you can click on this icon and then there, there's going to be a pop up and you will be able to choose your channel. French, Spanish, or English if you don't do anything. Um, and just be aware that the interpretation might not work for people joining on their tablets or phones, but it should work fine on your um, browsers. Um, this is also uh, participatory, so please be not shy um, and ask questions at any time. We will have a first round of um, five minute inputs by our panelists, but then we will move to like a more conversation style format. Um, so as I said, this week um, is considered a climate week. Um, and yet it's again, a little bit overshadowed by the never ending discussions on lockdown measures, etc. And the pandemic, even though it's so closely linked to the destruction um, on, of our environment and biodiversity, it is also why the initial declarations by the UK government and others for 2020 to be a year of climate action have had to be downscaled. And these days, as well as the following months, will be crucial to ensure public awareness that urgent climate action is needed now and that the recovery of our societies from that health and economic crisis must be a green recovery in all aspects. And that is why the Green European Foundation and the European Green Party are organizing this uh, Greening COP26 online hub for climate. It is to provide like a space for um, the green ecosystem <coughs> to keep the moment, um, the momentum alive in the movement. Um, and we have yeah, great panelists today to inspire you all to do so, bringing in different perspectives from different countries. So I'm really looking forward to having a conversation with them all. Let me briefly present um, each of them to you. So um, we first have um, the great honor to have Minister um, Leonore Gewessler with us. So the Austrian Federal Minister for Climate Action, Environment, Energy, Mobility, Innovation and Technology since January 2020, so almost a year. And she's also the deputy chairwoman of the Green Parliamentary Group and previously served as director of the Green European Foundation. So thank you for being with us, Leonore. Thanks for having me. Um, we also have Mina Cholu. Um, for, she is the, they, they are the Federation of Young European Greens spoke, co-spokesperson and um, a trans, queer and feminist activist. Um, and their political work has in particular focused on LGDP BQI rights and environmental issues and the interlinkages. So I'm looking forward to hearing from you, Mina, um, and your insights. Um, we then have Molly Scott Catto, a green economist and expert on cooperatives and social enterprise, sustainable finance, monetary policy and tax policy. And in May 2014, Molly was elected as the first green to represent Southwest England and Gibraltar in the European Parliament, where she served until Brexit. Um, and today, Molly is still National Green Party speaker on finance and on Brexit. So I'm looking forward to hearing from, from the UK. Thank you very much for helping us stay close to Europe. We appreciate that. Um, we next have um, Monsieur François Gemene. He's a specialist of environmental geopolitics and migration governance at the Uni Université de Liège, where he's also the director of the Hugo Observatory. And he lectures on climate change and migration policies in different universities, including Sciences Po, where I also went, by the way, so 
um, you were also my professor. And he also um, heads the Observatory on Defense and Climate of the French Ministry of Defense and is the lead author of the IPCC. So welcome, Francois Gimel. And last but not least, we have Timothy Parik, who holds a PhD in economics that's titled The Political Economy of Degrowth. And his dissertation explores the economic implications of the idea of degrowth and post-growth. And he's also the lead author of Decoupling Debunked Evidence and Arguments Against Green Growth. That, was, um, that can be found on the website of the European Environmental Bureau. So thank you for being with us, Timothy. Hello. So the fifth anniversary of the Paris Accord is also so important because it will test government's willingness to step up action to cut greenhouse gas emissions. The climate plans, known as the Nationally Determined Contributions, NDCs, define policies lasting until 2025 or 2030 and are the core building blocks of the Paris Agreement. And each five years, countries have to update these um, targets and they have to be more ambitious. And that also applies to the European Union. And um, the Twitter is um, very has been very active this morning um, that the leaders on the European um, Council summit have actually agreed on a minus 55% target. So, uh, Leonore, the first question would go to you, as you are an insider and ne negotiator yourself on the climate law um, in the NB Council. So, um, what have your expectations been on the EU um, summit um, yesterday and today? Um, how do you take the, the news that are um, that are coming? Is the agreement on the reduction um, target a success? Do you think the EU will be a role model with this climate law? Um, and what are also the implications for the member states that also have to um, implement policies to actually reach that target? Thanks a lot. Uh, thanks a lot again for the invitation. And um, it, it feels very nice to be back in a Jeff event. So uh, thanks a lot for having me uh, today. Uh, indeed, this was um, not only an exciting week, but uh, an exciting night um, uh, with a lot of discussions, a lot of back and forth. But I think that's the most important result, a result. A uh, European Council that agreed unanimously on at least minus 55% as a goal for our 2030 ambition. So, um, and I'd like to maybe embed it a bit in the discussion, in the, in the discussion we, or also the, the framework of the Paris Agreement, because um, yes, we are celebrating the, the, the anniversary of the Paris Agreement tomorrow. And I think that's indeed something to celebrate. It was a historic step, but also we have to be clear, the agreement was never an end in itself. The agreement itself is not climate action yet. Um, the agreement was the start of a journey, the start of a journey to take real action, um, to realize the objective to stay well below 2%, to pursue efforts to limit temperature increase to 1.5 degrees. So it was the beginning of a journey. And since that beginning, I think that's that's the time span we should look at, what happened in the last five years and what happened also then in the last week. And um, I think on the one hand side, um, we see that a lot has happened in our societies. A lot has happened since 2015. Um, young people who take to the streets, who, uh, who fight for their future, who, um, who, who step up and actually ask politics to deliver. We've, in Austria, we've had a popular initiative on uh, on climate action. So there is there there is a lot of change in in societies and leaders being called to action. Also, we see on the on the international stage, we see a lot of um, a lot of dynamics. And uh, the if we if we look at what um, the announcement that China did, the announcement that. Japan, South Korea did. If we look at uh, what President-elect Biden in the United States said, not only to rejoin the Paris Agreement, but also to make sure that the US is uh, CO2 neutral by 2050. There is a lot of, there is a sense of change. You might add, finally, uh, you might add um, much too late, but there is something moving now. And I think all of this uh, also goes back to the fact that the climate agreement that the Paris climate agreement now plays out its strength that we have this five year ambition cycle that now we are called upon to deliver um, a 
better NDC, a higher NDC, an ambitious NDC. And uh, so this, this makes me, um, and even though we are in the midst of an historic health crisis, um, we are discussing, we are getting serious on, on climate action. So I, that's for me after um, the, po the very positive side of this. In terms of the agreement that we um, that we just had, um, that it, it was a, a tense debate. It was an intense debate, but I think the most important result is indeed that we have a result. We have a unanimous agreement of at least minus 55% uh, CO2 reduction towards uh, for 2030, but also there, um, this is not an end in itself. It's a starting point. It's not only a starting point for the uh, negotiations with the European Parliament in the trilogue to find it to, to conclude also uh, the, the the climate law and everything that comes with it. M more importantly, it's a starting point for a lot of legislative and policy debate, because now uh, the next step is that we need to deliver in every single legislative file, in every single policy file towards achieving these goals. So um, I think the um, Austria supported the minus, uh, at least minus 55%. Um, all, Austria is always very strong in saying this needs to be a scenario where Europe 2050 is 100% renewable. So that, that we, we need to look at, um, at this as a, a transformation towards 100% renewable scenario. Um, and the, um, and if we look at um, at what we have on the table, I think um, this. I think this is really a good starting point. It's a necessary starting point. It's a. It's it's an important starting point, but uh, it's it's good that we have it now. As you can see, it's been a long night. I'm I'm happy that we have it now, because I think one of the key messages also that that I think we need to take forward now in the next uh, weeks and months after these intense political debates that we had in the last. Uh, hours and also weeks is that we need to take seriously leaving no one behind. Um, we all know that we have certain groups, we have certain countries that are really heavily affected by, by measures that will have maybe an even bigger task than Austria has in, in this transformation towards a climate neutral society. However, we need to make sure that leaving no one behind doesn't mean holding a continent back. And I think this is uh, this is the balance we need to strike now in moving forward. That um, we cannot adapt adapt the the strategy of a continent on those with the largest obstacles to overcome. But we have to make sure we find means, we find instruments, we 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 take uh, everybody on board and by the hand to actually deliver on on these on these goals. And I think. Uh, many of the instruments that have been discussed in the course of the night from the modernization fund to the just transition fund will be extremely uh, important in this regard but with this whole setting in mind um, i'm i'm happy that we have this agreement I, uh, and uh, but now the real work starts Thank you very much, um, Minister Leoranek Gewesslein. Thank you again for even being with us after this uh, night. Um, um, that was really great that you could share um, some insights. And um, we will definitely come back to your talking points about uh, leaving no one behind and um, holding not holding an entire continent back and what are instruments to do so. Um, we will definitely debate that um, later on. Um, the next, my, my next question now goes to um, Mina, because we also talked about, well, that uh, at least 55% target is a great success, and that was not even uh, thinkable uh, like a couple of years ago that uh, leaders would unanimously agree on that. And the youth movement is uh, also to be held responsible for this success, I think. Um, it has been crucial in putting higher pressure on decision makers to consider that topic really a top priority and uh, treat it with the urgency it deserves. Um, so, Mina, do you feel like the voices of the youth have been really heard with that European Green Deal um, and legislation on climate and other environmental issues? Um, and I would also be particularly interested in your work around a just transition, as um, Leonor just mentioned as well, because just transition has become somewhat of, of a buzzword, and it's often used to refer to 
alleviating negative economic impacts in regions still heavily dependent on fossil fuels, uh, most notably on coal, but just as an inclusion and a low carbon transition can also mean much more and refer to many other groups. So uh, please, Mina, share your insights on these topics. So first of all, I want to uh, thank you on behalf of FYG for having us uh, be part of this very important conversation. And it's great to be here. Um, let's start with, are we, do we feel like you voices have been heard? I mean, yes and no. Um, the fact that we do see these improvements, the fact that we know that once you, once you mobilize enough, once you're enough people on the streets, um, with very specific and clear demands we're, we're actually being heard and 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 um the movement actually starts to have power and it's not only lobbyists and and corporates that are that are that are being listened to um but still at the same time it, it doesn't feel like enough um it's this yeah the, there seems to be like a greenwashing and, and youth washing and kind of being like, yeah, okay, we listened to you, but now that's enough. Okay, thank you. Um, and and so as as FYG, we really think that you know we need to we need to balance this. Like, let's kick the polluters out of like the decision making spaces. Um, let's let let governments really commit to not giving any public money for fossil fuel subsidies and also allow citizens to lead also in these processes and not 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 just this, make this a top down approach but really bottom up and then this is this is really like the importance of um citizen action and movements at at cop and what obviously we've we've been missing this year but we're trying to mobilize online and, and keep that momentum going uh, for climate action because it, it must remain a priority and a political priority and and as has been mentioned previously also in this in this in this greening cop 26 hub the the current uh crisis the covid 19 crisis only kind of points towards a system a system a systemic issue and one therefore that really must uh, take into consideration all voices and and so i think this brings me to just transition um certainly uh for for fyg we've actually been working on uh this year all of our plans have obviously had to shift online but we've had had the opportunity to discuss with young greens from across europe um and with various movement leaders and young leaders what a just transition means to us and 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 indeed it being feminist and inclusive is one of those kind of central tenets for us. Um, because without acknowledging that there are pre-existing injustices and that a lot of work does not get paid and a lot of work that doesn't get paid is, is actually tends to be work carried out by women, um, means that unless we kind of acknowledge these discrepancies and this current system that we are in, uh, then, then indeed women will be left behind, but also others. Um, so because, I mean, it would, you know, I've, I was asked a question at, a, at another event on security a few weeks ago, and it was kind of like, but why are the youth like so, so angry about climate or like why why do we see that energy on climate but maybe not necessarily always on other issues and i think it's like we really feel the urgency of this and we really feel like we're not part of the conversation and we really feel like you know this is going to impact our lives more than more than anything in the future in the coming years and we already feel its impact on our lives and and yet and yet our voices are not being heard so so again like a, a just transition that that is an actual plan that is actually uh, giving us options and opportunities for um, that that makes sense that that are actually future looking and not stuck in the past um, retraining for 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 workers that makes sense and is not kind of stuck within old systems and I think we need to be given spaces to imagine and reimagine and envision and and we're not seeing that and we're not given that opportunity because often uh we're especially we're, we're stuck kind of and i think this is goes for like many movements like when you're stuck trying to just 
just uh well work uh have 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 you know your basic needs met then it becomes very very difficult to to imagine and 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 create and and think and revision what the future can look like and 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 all that energy gets lost and i think this is like covid-19 a lot of people said it's great it it's also because it's also allowed us to slow down and rethink things and connect um and in many ways it has but um many essential workers um and many workers on the front line including those doing gig work in order to survive have not had that chance to slow down and reconnect and 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 start to rethink what can change in their lives and i think this is similar here now when we're when we're talking about managing the climate crisis um would what what spaces can be given for and what you know what's what there's only so much space we can take up and so like what spaces can also be given for us to 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 be there and reimagine a future that is going to be ours more than more than anyone else's and as, as imagine a future for future generations um but again to come back to like some key political priorities for 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 FYG and link it also to one of the last statements by by minister leonora is that of leaving no one behind and and i would like to hear a bit more about what leaving no one behind but not holding a continent back means because i think that europe and and the colonizing nations of europe have left so many others behind constantly and have have uh continue to be like it's a historical but a, but a also a very contemporary colonization and neo colonization that is happening um and and this is concerning i mean i think uh you know europe needs to show solidarity it's not about who gets ahead in the world it's not about progress it's not always about growth uh but it is about care and health and looking out for each other and taking care of each other it's not an us versus them and so a statement such as not holding a continent back feels to me a bit concerning because is that is that coming from an us versus them like oh but look at us we're so far ahead and like why would we stop when we're like going ahead of this momentum and i think actually we really need to slow down and 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 europe and richer richer countries must pay reparations and and we're not like yes in the context of climate but also in a in the colonial context a lot the reparations have not been paid for years and years of colonialism and and colonialism has had an effect on many communities around the world and in, including like from a broader perspective it has an effect on our on on diversity and gender and sexual diversity and i say this as an lgbt activist but it also has an effect on the fact of like abusing of and 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 using uh the resources uh to 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 the extent that we are now in this situation um so i'll stop there for now but it's 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 an interesting point leaving no one behind what does that actually mean Thanks a lot um Mina and definitely there are so many different uh, talking points and we will come back to them especially with respect to climate justice what that actually means um when we refer to leave no one behind is that a european centric debate is that an international debate we will definitely come back to that um i would now like to um give the floor to Molly um because well she's still she's still european but her um, home country has left the european union and i would now uh, like to slowly move to um uh, the bigger picture of climate negotiations um and molly as you also know both perspective as a scientist i'd like to hear from you um as a like a green economist do you feel like the the green economic academic debate and the political debate actually talk to each other enough um do you think that um the pandemic has maybe made politicians uh listen more to to scientists in more generally speaking and um i'd also like to hear from you about um the as as the uk is going to host the next cop that was originally scheduled in glasgow for november 2020 but now in november 2021 um 
how have preparations been going? Have they been overshadowed, overshadowed by Brexit? And what is the climate discourse um, like in the UK? Well, thank you, as I said at the beginning, for including me in this European debate. I appreciate it so much. I am, I remain, I will always be a European, as will everybody who lives in my country. I'd like to start by answering your question and also linking it back to some of the things that Mina said, because I think we've learned a lot from this pandemic, and I think we should use the learning and the changing of opinions to really, uh, as a springboard, into serious action on climate change. So, for example, we've learned that actually governments are incredibly powerful and they can move very swiftly and find the money they need to find when there's a serious crisis. And as you pointed out, we've also seen the astonishing achievements of developing a vaccine in this incredibly short time frame. A hundred years ago, when we had the flu pandemic, people literally didn't know what a virus was. And now within a year, we're, we have protection actually for the whole world in sight. And I think that ability to act globally and to, to mobilize the knowledge and the skills of our scientists is something that also we need to apply to the climate crisis. And I think we've also learned a lot about what really makes us happy and all that kind of crazy jetting around we were doing um, and, you know, a lot of the uh, businessmen flying around the world and the commuting. These things have had to go and people actually find in many ways they're just as happy. We have to temper this with um, issues about people who are incredibly uh, in poverty and incredible difficulty. But still, we can rethink what we value about an economy. And perhaps we'll come back to that when we have the interactive discussions later on. In terms of what's happening in the UK, you may have seen there was a, a so-called 10 point plan for the environment a couple of weeks ago, which was actually a shopping list. It wasn't a plan as such. And um, we were quite critical of that as the Green Party. And our criticism revolved around the fact that essentially what our government was doing, which I think we see from a lot of politicians, is setting a target for somebody else to reach. You know, a, a politician is going to be in the front line for 10 years, maybe a bit more. Um, and so if they set a target for 2030, they know they will not be held for, responsible for delivering on that. And so essentially what they're doing is sounding good, producing hot air and leaving the action for somebody else. And so what we said very strongly was um, not only is this plan nothing like radical enough to actually address what the science tells us needs to be done, but it's also promises for the future and what we need is action today. So we came out with our own 10 point plan uh, yesterday, which is actually drawn from our manifesto and it felt a little bit scary doing this, but it's only saying what needs to be said in order to, to have some chance of staying within two degrees or preferably 1.5 degrees, which is still our target as, as UK Greens. And so two things we proposed just to give you a, an idea of the, the, the sort of scope of what we were saying. One was that we need to reduce aviation by 70% um, in the UK by 2030. And we also want to introduce a carbon tax of £100 a tonne, now rising to £500 a tonne by 2050. And people are like throwing up their hands in horror. But that's the whole point, because by 2050, we don't want people to be able to afford to use fossil fuels. And like I said to a, to a colleague, you know, if you're still using coal by 2050, it's to make jewellery, you know, not, not just to burn. Um, and we obviously match that proposal for a very swinging carbon tax with a dividend paid to citizens. And so we always link it to our universal basic income proposal, but also to proposals around free home insulation, home improvements, retrofitting, uh, much cheaper public transport. So we, we get the money from the carbon tax. We invest that in transforming society so that we don't need to use the fossil fuels um, by the time we get to the end of the 10 year period. And then again, linking back to something Mina said, taking a global perspective now, I think there's, there's an idea which we're beginning to work through, and which I would love to work through with Jeff and with other European Green parties, which is about connecting what we're saying about the need for loss and damage, um, taking responsibility for loss and damage as the industrial nations of the world with our historic responsibility for colonization and the enslavement of uh, African people. And, We've seen earlier in the year, and I think it wasn't a coincidence that these two came together, the climate crisis and Black Lives Matter. They are the same struggle. And we can make a political proposal uniting these two 
if we take the issue of reparations seriously, and the British Green Party passed, uh, um, the England and Wales Green Party, sorry, passed a motion supporting reparations at our autumn conference, and we want to, to make a proposal for COP that connects that uh, cry for not only understanding our history, but actually taking responsibility for repairing the damage we've done, connect that to the, rep to the damage we've done to the world's climate. And again, this is something, you know, I hope people have comments on and we can raise questions on, but that's to me a, a positive proposal in terms of global climate justice. And I think the Greens are the people to put this forward. And obviously the Green parties in Europe have that colonial shame that they have to um, atone for. And, but we, but the thing is being Greens, we also have uh, parties in the countries in Africa and Asia who will be who need to have those reparations made. So I'd like to hear what people think of that. I'm kind of floating that as a proposal. I think it's something exciting that we could put forward as the European Greens. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Again, many um, important and interesting issues raised, and I'm sure that um, the other panelists have something to say about that as well. It also ties back to you know the future that we want, the future of work, and also the future of the entire economic model. And Timothy will also, I think, comment on that one. Um, but before talking about the really big uh, systemic picture, um, I'd like to give the floor to François Gimen. Um, First of all, as you're an expert and member of the IPCC, I'd like to hear from you uh, with respect to how policy makers actually listen to science from your perspective. Um, how do you see the impact of the Paris Agreement on global climate policy? Has that been a success? What were shortcomings? Um, is the model itself um, successful? What are still the big fish to fry in Glasgow next year? And lastly, I know that's a lot of questions, but mm -hmm. we will to them. Um, I saw that on Twitter you had um, a somewhat unpo unpopular opinion that um, you didn't think that um, the US rejoining the Paris Agreement was just good news. So um, please, some comments from your side. Sure. Thank you very much for, for having me. Uh, well, that's a lot of questions and, and I'll try to make a, an answer as concise and as consistent as possible. Um, first, yes, uh, as a lead order of the APCC, Obviously, I can only uh, rejoice of the agreement that was reached at the European level last night. And of course, uh, we can always say that the agreement could have been more ambitious. We can always be critical. But at some point, we also need to recognize that things are moving in the right direction. And I think that uh, it needs to be supported and encouraged uh, at the moment. And I have to say that at least in the field of climate change, um, we feel as scientists that we are increasingly uh, listened to by policymakers, and this is obviously good news. Um, the problem, I would say, is that if we look beyond uh, the European Union, uh, the news are not so um, reassuring. Uh, and the, the coronavirus pandemic and the, the, the reboost plans have been an opportunity for many governments to reinvest billions of dollars or of euros uh, into fossil fuels. This is the case in Canada. This is the case in India. This is the case in Brazil. This is the case in South Africa, um, which means that even though uh, I would agree that the relaunch plan of the European Union is going in the right direction and is clearly an investment for the future, we cannot say the same for all other governments. Uh, there are other good news, however, ahead of uh, the COP26 in Glasgow. Uh, and I would say that the major good news um, came from China on September 22nd of this year, when China announced that its greenhouse gas emissions would reach their peak by 2030 at the latest, and that China would um, achieve carbon neutrality by 2060. This is obviously... Uh, another good news, and I would say that the objectives of China and of the EU seem relatively aligned uh, with each other. However, if we need to do some stock kicking of what has been accomplished since the signature of the Paris Agreement five years ago, uh, we have to consider this. Uh, this year, 2020, will see a drop of about 7% of global greenhouse gas emissions which means that for the first time since the signature of the Paris Agreement, we will be on a trajectory that is compatible with the objectives of the Paris Agreement. 
And we will be on this trajectory, not because we have chosen it, but because we had no other choice than put our countries in lockdown before, because of the sanitary crisis. Uh, and therefore, we need to realize that in terms of emission reductions, the sanitary crisis has been able to achieve what our climate policies have not been able to achieve so far. Uh, and I guess it says a lot uh, about how much more we need to do. And obviously, we will not be able to take the same measures as the one we took for the coronavirus crisis, that is closing the borders or putting countries in lockdown in the future. Uh, climate change will require policies that we can sustain in the long run. And I think that it is extremely important that this crisis serves as a wake-up call ahead of COP26 as to the fact that until 2019, we couldn't see any effect of the pledges and the commitments in the Paris Agreement to actually influence or impact the curve of our greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, this means that so far, the commitments and the pledges made in the Paris Agreement have been New Year's Eve resolutions. That is something that you promise to do and that you never do. Uh, that's not to say that nothing has been done, but obviously the figures do not add up so far. Uh, so at COP26, I would say that the challenge will be first to make sure that countries uh, upgrade their commitments if we add up the different national commitments and if we compare this with the collective objective, clearly this doesn't add up. Uh, and the national commitments as they are today are still leading us towards a temperature change of about 3.5 degrees by the end of the century. So we need to make sure that countries upgrade their commitments. So I welcome the fact that EU just upgraded its commitment. China also upgraded its commitment, Britain, upgraded its commitment a few days ago. Japan did the same. South Korea did the same. This is very good news. And this is clearly going in the right direction. And I'm hoping that other countries will follow in the coming weeks or in the coming months. But we also need to make sure that countries respect these commitments. So making these commitments is one step, but it's not enough. As of now, only about 10% of countries that signed the Paris Agreement if respected their, their commitments. And I think that for this, we need to make more binding commitments and we need to drop these long-term objectives by the middle of the century or by the end of the century. Let's be clear, uh, many current politicians will be dead by the middle of the century and certainly by the end of the century. So we need objectives that we can monitor in the short run. It is important to know the horizon, what is the plan by the middle of the century, but it is also extremely important to know what we will be doing next year and the year after, and to hold policymakers accountable for reaching these objectives. So I think this is something that will need to happen at COP26, that we take closer objectives that we can monitor and that, so that we can follow whether or not we're in the right trajectory. And now to come to the uh, final uh, point of my answer, um, what does the election of Joe Biden in the US change? Uh, obviously, it is excellent news for the climate. Uh, any climate policy made by any other president cannot be worse than the climate policies that were implemented under Donald Trump. Uh, and we can expect that at least Joe Biden will reinstate some of the measures that had been taken by Barack Obama. But obviously, Joe Biden will need to do much more than that. Uh, and in this sense, I think we should be cautious about the announcement that the, that the US will rejoin the Paris Agreement as of January 20th. Obviously, everyone thinks that this is excellent news. And I reckon that this is an important signal of a re-engagement of the US into international cooperation. And this sends a strong signal also that this is a priority for the new administration. Yet, I think that we mustn't forget three things. The first one is that the goal of the Paris Agreement is to send a clear signal of long-term cooperation 
also to companies and market. And this signal has to be a signal of stability and long-term commitment. And while I would welcome the US coming back into the Paris Agreement, my fear is that if, tw if in 2024, Ivanka Trump is elected as the next US president, we could assume that she would then exit again the Paris Agreement. And I'm concerned that if there is a movement of back and forth, depending on the result of the US elections, that would send a terrible signal to companies and markets that would send a signal of instability and of fragility of the Paris Agreement if international cooperation depends on the result of US elections. We need to make clear that the US or any other country cannot just come and go into the agreement depending on the result of its national elections. The second risk that I see uh, is that even though we're all, of course, very enthusiastic at the news of the election of Joe Biden, we need at least to remember that even democratic administrations in the US have always tried to lower the level of ambition of international cooperation. That was the case under Barack Obama. That was the case under Bill Clinton. And we know that at COP26, we will need a stronger and renewed ambition than ever. Um, and yet my fear is that, for example, our return of the US to the table of negotiation could prevent other negotiators from adopting more binding mechanisms. For example, we know that the US Senate will always be against binding mechanism. And I think that we should be extremely careful that the return of the US should not tone down the level of ambition of in the international cooperation. And three, final point, uh, we need to make sure that this announcement doesn't hide a weak uh, level of ambition on the federal level. Uh, there is no need to be in the Paris Agreement uh, to decarbonize your economy. And many of, uh, of the policies that would allow this decarbonation of the US economy actually depend on mayors and on governors. And, and therefore, we need to also be aware that there is only so much that Joe Biden will be able to do uh, much will have to be done by mayors and governors. So, in a nutshell, I think that obviously the re-engagement of the US in international cooperation is good news. The election of Joe Biden is excellent news for the climate, but we shouldn't be over-enthusiastic at the idea that the US will rejoin the Paris Agreement. I think there are also some risks associated with that that we might have to consider. Thank you so much, uh, Francois Germain. That was a little longer than the other, so I'm sorry. Uh, I will give I will give back the time uh, during the panel. But that was, um, yeah, very interesting insights, um, both res with respect to that emission gap that we have between pledges. Hmm. Yes, that that is my fault, indeed. Um, so yes, you mentioned that um, even all the pledges would not actually be enough to uh, reach the targets, um, and so we also have to yeah ask a, a broader, more systemic question about the the model that has already been um, raised to some degree by other panelists as well. Um, and we all know that this would not be like the the year that we saw in 2020 is not the um, way that. Uh, degrowth uh, advocates would um, like to see emissions being uh, reduced. So yes, I would like to hear from Timothée Parik. So you write about um, decoupling, um, the, the, the possibilities and impossibilities of decoupling um, GDP growth and um, environmental impacts. You write about becoming less independent from economic growth in general, living within planetary boundaries, etc. And yet um, economic growth itself is uh, is still not really questioned, I feel, by most uh, big uh, political um, institutions. And also the European Green Deal itself um, is labeled as a growth strategy by the European Commission. So um, how important do you think is the narrative of economic growth in times of economic hardship and, and the pandemic right now? How can we reconcile the climate urgency and the biodiversity crisis um, with these imperatives? Or can we maybe not do so at all? Um, and uh, yes, should the discussion around the Paris objective and emission reductions also include a more fundamental discussion about um, economic and social models? 
also very broad. Thank you for these questions, and it's it's a great pleasure uh, to be here. I I've got a strange relationship to the Paris Agreement because I, I started my PhD studies straight after we adopted the Paris Agreement. So, and if I think about uh, the insight I had in, in the last five years, trying to better understand the, the, the climate crisis, I would really want to focus on, on two main points, two things that were uh, true five years ago when I started my PhD thesis and are unfortunately still true today. And two things that I think are uh, blocking our discussions about sustainability. The first one is that we need to unbelieve in the story of decoupling. So five years ago, we wrote in the SDGs that the objective should be to, quote, decouple economic growth from environmental degradation. For an ecological economist like myself, this is the equivalent of wishing to decouple fire from smoke. Not going to happen. So we could get into technical discussions about why this is so, or just look at the last decades of decoupling efforts. We had a massive GDP bonfire, and the best we could do is to remove, and let me here be mathematically precise, a tiny, 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 tiny bit of smoke. So the decoupling hypothesis has been here for a long time. And of course, we, we hear very often that maybe, perhaps one day, who knows, decoupling will happen. Problem is, it hasn't. And in that context, and considering the current correlation between market activities and, and greenhouse gas emissions, material footprint, biodiversity, etc., advocating for further growth is suicidal. So that's that's my take on, on the, the new growth strategy of, uh, of the commission. Instead, I would want, why not just follow the precautionary principle? Assume that decoupling is going to remain tiny and downscale uh, polluting forms of pollution and consumption today. But that's the second problem. We're not doing this because we are terrified of degrowth. Uh, I'm, I'm an economist, but when I discuss about degrowth, I rather feel like a therapist. Degrowth has become the, the boogeyman of our capitalist consciousness. Many, many people think of it as the end of progress. Degrowth as a synonym for with regression and joblessness, regression and joylessness. Uh, but they're wrong. The idea that of reducing and stabilizing the biophysical metabolism of our economies is not that monstrous. In fact, it is how most social ecological systems work. They grow up to a point where they can strive. They don't grow forever like we want our economies to do. So my point here is that the fast and furious economies of the 20th century are the exceptions rather than the rule. It's an economic abnormality that is maladapted to the Anthropocene. So we need a new economic system, one that manages to satisfy everyone's needs without putting planetary health at risk. And this is not science fiction. Most of the system already exists except that these thoughts and ideas and practices have just been hidden in the periphery of what we consider to be realistic or pragmatic. So a post-growth economic system, as I see it, would be made of, for example, a, a circular economy with caps on resource use and pollution, legal caps. Resources would be treated as commons to be managed democratically. Voluntary simplicity as an ethics of consumption socially useful production, for example, via not-for-profit cooperatives and other social enterprises, convivial technology and social innovation, a healthy relation with work, with less time spent in employment and more time spent in self-determined activities, free public services protecting from exclusion, alternative currencies embedded in moral values, strong mechanisms of pre-distribution, distribution and redistribution, and most importantly, and here pardon my French, joie de vivre, because what the point of having an economy if it makes us miserable? And actually, a post-growth economic system would be made of whatever, whatever we want a post-growth economic system to be made of. And that's my main point. This is not a technical, but a political question. A political question that requires us to educate our desires beyond the narrow and wicked story of more money is better. We often joke that it is easier to imagine the end of the world than the end of economic growth. I'm, I'm only 30 years old, but I'm already tired of joking like this. So I'm, I want to end up by being a bit provocative. If you're in charge 
of important economic matters. And if you really cannot imagine the end of economic growth, then retire. Retire and let others invent the economies of the future. Thank you for that very passionate statement. Um, and now it is time to uh, kickstart the, the discussion. And I again invite all of our um, audience to really ask your questions. So this, this is your opportunity. You have not been very active. So please don't be shy, ask questions. Um, so we have one first question coming in, but um, I would first like to address a more general question to um, different panelists. Um, so I'd like to uh, briefly refer to the um, emissions gap report that basically assesses um, what, what Francois Germain has also commented on, the difference between where we are likely to be with all the climate bread, um, pledges and we were where we need to be um, to be consistent with uh, the 1.5 or maybe a two point target. And basically the, the report just came out and it concluded that, um, well, it asked the question, are we on track on bridging this gap? Absolutely not. Um, so, but the, the, the report also says that um, the, the money that is being poured into the economies right now can also be really the opportunity now to um, speed up the low carbon transition and create more structural changes. So I'd like to hear from you, what are your ideas for a green recovery? Where should all the recovery money um, in the European Union be spent? Um, what are the priority sectors, etc.? cetera? And, um, Leonora, maybe you also want to comment on what was said um, by Mina on um, holding the continent back, um, et cetera. So maybe you can start. Yes, my pleasure. Um, actually, I, I wanted to start on this point also because what, what I said was meant in the context of reaching an agreement at the council. Because um, we need to discuss how we get to these goals, but we but we need to set goals and we need to, we need to make sure that, that the pathway, this guiding line of a goal that gets us into the right direction, but we cannot let the difficulties of getting there becoming a discussion on whether we even want to go there. That was, it was really my point on the negotiation where I totally agree was the question on, um, or this was also not meant as a, as a European centric focus. If we talk about, uh, and the instruments I mentioned, the Just Transition Fund, the Modernization Fund, et cetera, are instruments of solidarity. Are they enough? That's exactly the question. Do we need something else? That's exactly the question. But uh, but it, it's it's just how can we together reach the goal without uh, with, without um, blocking us from even trying? Yeah, that, that was the point I was trying to make. The, um, the Obviously, it has a, a strong international dimension and a strong uh, international responsibility that Europe has. Uh, so that's why, and that's why one of the first things we did in the Austrian budget was to uh, almost quadruple our contribution to the Green Climate Fund. Uh, of course, it was a, it was not one of the most generous uh, contributions before the Greens took office, but. We, we really stepped up our international um, obligation and our in international responsibility. And yes, it is our responsibility to look beyond our own borders, to look beyond the borders of the continent. Um, and um, what, and in, in terms of, of, I'd like to pick up what Francois said, I, I think it's important that we set ourselves a goal that brings us closer to what we, to ambition we need towards the Paris Agreement. The emissions gap is, uh, is is still there. That's totally clear. At the same time, we see an analysis from the from Climate Action Tracker that tries to accommodate if if Japan, South Korea, China, US, uh, EU doesn't only stay a headline goal but is implemented, then we move a lot closer to the two two degrees. Still far from one point five, but. We are, we have to acknowledge, I think that there is a shift taking place, but where I'm really, really 100% uh, in agreement with Francois is that we, we need to keep the long-term goal in mind, but we need to make sure we know what we do the next year, what's our next step also for our societies and for, uh, for all the countries to follow. 
because we need to make this very concrete. What does it mean? What does it mean for our, uh, for, for people who are not very concretely for people who work in the Austrian, um, uh, industry working towards combustion engine cars? Yeah. What, what does it mean? What, what's the perspective we offer them? What's the perspective we, the, the training we can give them? What's the next steps? What does it mean for their livelihood for their, so, it's very, we have to get very concrete and we have to deliver in every single step of, of the way. So that's why I think this moment in time is so crucial. And that's why I, I also agree that, um, that um, while we see in many recovery packages, not the ambition we need, I think in, in Europe, we're at least looking at this in the, in the, in the right direction. And um, we, are, we are in the middle of, of the greatest pandemic. We are, making it clear that we have to set up the recovery packages in a way that they deliver on climate action also. And, um, and, and as, as somebody fighting for every single centimeter, millimeter, meter, sometimes kilometer of the way, I think this is a really important sign and it's different. It's a different sign from the last, uh, from the last crisis. It's, if one, when I took office in January, in March, people told me, forget about climate change for the rest of this year. Yeah, forget about your, you, you can go on holiday now for the, for the rest of your mandate. And it's quite the contrary. What we did in Austria is that we built a huge climate investment package. We have 2 billion euro um, now for the next two years to, um, to build back differently. Yeah, to, to build back more resilient, greener uh, towards uh, clim the climate neutrality goal that we set ourselves in Austria uh, to become climate neutral by 2040. Uh, we, we built climate action in every single instrument that we, that we built, from support to the, uh, to the communities up until support to businesses. Uh, to give you one example, we, we um, built an investment premium for businesses that doubles if they invest in climate action, but it excludes counterproductive investments. So no car scrapping schemes, no combustion um, uh, combustion engine, um, trucks, whatever. Yeah, it, it's, um, it's a first in Austria that we do this. Yeah, it's, uh, and, I, and I think these are very, very important steps on the way. And now, um, of course, there's a ton, tons of legislation coming up, but I think it's, it's really important that, while I, I, I'm 100% convinced we need these ambitious goals because they guide all the legislation that comes beyond. I think what we really need to focus on is implementation, is action now, as Molly said, uh, because that's that's what we that that's what we need and that's what we're what we're doing in Austria very very consistently. Not only on our way back out of the out of the COVID induced um, situation that that we have now, but also in terms of uh, a renewables act, the new climate law, the new energy efficiency law. So we're working on a lot of different uh, issues at the moment, but the work only begins. <laughs> I'm very clear on that. The work is only starting. Yeah. As you said, the start of the beginning of, a, or the beginning of a journey. Um, Thank you. Molly, you wanted to comment on that um, with respect to the more short-term targets that we also need to achieve, not just the, the big long-term targets that are being set by somebody that uh, doesn't have to achieve, achieve them, him or herself. Um, please go ahead. You're, some, you're muted. Please unmute yourself. How strange. There you go. That must have been a, a mysterious interference from somewhere, probably a Brexit-related thing. Um, so. It's really helpful to hear from Lisa. I can imagine those negotiations. So thank you for sitting through that. Um, and it's great now that we've got Greens in government in, in various countries of the EU. But what we have to, to manage now, and this is quite difficult to manage, is how to make the sufficiently radical uh, demands and proposals, which it's easy for me to make as um, a, a British Green, where we're, you know, we've got one MP, although even there, there's a compromise has to be made, of course. Um, you know, and some other countries like Germany, where there's such a big support for the Greens and they want to get it more and Austria where you're in government and the same in Sweden, the same in Ireland and so on. So I think that's something we need to debate as European Greens because we can't backtrack on what we know is necessary in order to um, to be comfortable with our partners in government and it's it's a difficult one that we have to balance I think. I mean you've, you've said exactly the sorts of things we need to be introducing. I don't think the shopping list is difficult. We, we know exactly what we need to do. I think the difficult part as you identified is precisely the fact that jobs are going to go 
And um, obviously our opponents on the left are going to use that against us because it's like you Greens, you don't care about people in aviation losing their jobs. And so, as you say, we have to have absolutely tight proposals for what a Green New Deal looks like for the aviation sector, what a Green New Deal looks like in different industries and so on. Um, and that, I think, you know, requires a lot of, of energy. We, we've done a few of those in the UK, but I think, as you say, that's it, it would be nice if other people were doing that work. But we need to have that work there because we need to be able to say, you know, of course, you will be losing your job um, selling people things at an airport. But on the other hand, you'll be able to have a job over here. You know, we need to be able to say that um, and with detail. I just wanted to briefly um, come back to what Timote said as well, because if I, if he hadn't been here, I would probably have made the sort of points he was making. And so I wanted to say, yeah, it was great, great to hear that stuff. And I just wanted to give an example relating to COVID, which is that there was a lot of criticism in the UK about people who were staying at home and making their own sandwiches and not going out and sitting in a commute, you know, producing carbon dioxide because the petrol stations they would have bought the, the petrol from and the sandwich shops are now going out of business. So it's kind of like go and do something that's destructive for the environment, sit in a commute when you could be happily working from home because you're the person that has to make sure we continue to have economic growth. And this kind of encapsulates the complete insanity of a system that's driven by growth as a fetish. And, that, and as you say, I think that's, that's the kind of madness side. But the positive side is actually people were much happier spending more time at home. A lot of people, not everybody, but and, you know, here we all are having this conference without me having to have got on a train and come to Paris or Brussels or wherever and spent that carbon dioxide and my time. So, yeah, so I think that's that's such an important lesson and it's a good time to share that. But I just also wanted to say in terms of the economic aspect of the COVID recovery, we're going to have the right coming back now saying, look, we're worried about that debt and with their awful siren song of austerity. But we're, we're going to have the left saying, yes, we can borrow, but we need growth to repay that debt. And we have to challenge both of those destructive narratives because as Greens, we say we'll invest now to save the need for investment later. We'll pay now to make a post growth economy, to make a steady state economy that everybody's provided for. And that message needs to be going out strongly now, because otherwise we'll either get horrible austerity and more social and the environmental destruction, or we'll get a real foot down on the growth pedal that the environment can't stand. So, of course, we're right as Greens, we know that, but we need to be making that economic point that Timothée is making very strongly right now, I think. Thank you. And yeah, maybe coming back to, to Tim uh, right now with respect to, well, how would you like to see the recovery funds being spent um, to like reflect your vision um, of a world where everybody is, is, is provided for and that it, that remains within planetary boundaries? And we also have a question um, with regards to that from Sarah. Um, and she basically asks, so she, she agrees with you, Tim. Uh, that the refusal to think about what post-growth could look like is outdated. Um, but she's wondering how we can mainstream this topic more and have constructive debate in the green movement. And um, she's wondering if you have come across communication or successful methods that um, like the green movement could consider. Yeah, I, I think we need to focus, I mean, and, and we've been using that, that word a lot in, in that previous conversation, we need to focus on concrete needs. And that's, I think, the real uh, learning points for me as a political economist of this pandemic. Like when the pandemic started to kick in in spring, you know, we didn't say like, oh, you know, we need to maximize GDP growth and hope that some of it will, you know, produce masks and some of it will trick and trickle down into like income support for the most disadvantaged. No, we put that aside. We stopped looking at the GDP and we did what had to be done. So now, like, if you're asking me what, uh, you know, I want that, that money to be spent on, I want it to be spent on concrete needs. And more than this, on investment that allow to satisfy these concrete needs independently of economic growth. I'll give you one example. We often uh, get into the debate of the jobs that will be lost uh, with the, in the ecological transition, in aviation and manufacturing of automobiles and, and things like this. And before... It was always, it looks like a daunting challenge financially on how, you know, we can guarantee an income for these people during that transition. Now, I mean, I'm French and I've spent the, the pandemic in, in France and, you know, we had like an income support for half of the employees of the private sector. I mean, something historical, a basic. So now we realize that just guaranteeing an income 
for those workers in fossil sectors, waiting for them to be retrained and transition to other green jobs, which are often of higher quality in terms of, of well-being at work, is financially possible, just a matter of political will. So now I think instead of, of treating that, that pot of money in a very abstract manner, we need to do what Molly was talking about, investing in our ability to have a post-growth economy that actually functions without uh, leaving anyone behind. So that's that's the key question of exclusion. And I want to make another point linked to this, of course, because we, we haven't <laughs> talked that much about the European Green Deal. But I, I, I think we need to acknowledge that there's a scientific inconsistency at the heart of the European Green Deal in the same way that there was a scientific inconsistency at the heart of the SDGs, having this SDG on economic growth that was from everything we know about the relation between economic growth and ecosystems was in contradiction with the other social and ecological objectives. So now I find it strange that the, the commission is repeating the same mistake, especially since other version of the Green New Deals, the one in the US, uh, the, the Green New Deal for Europe, like that were more progressive. I've, I've kind of uh, taken a distance from the objective of GDP maximization, again, focusing on concrete needs, let it be, you know, jobs and income for the most disadvantaged. So I find it uh, strangely uh, laggard compared to the, the other initiatives. Um, and, and perhaps another point uh, linked to a question you, you asked me that I, I stuck in my head, you, you asked me, how can we achieve well-being without running after economic growth in terms of GDP? And every time I receive this question, I find it kind of strange. The question should rather be, how can we achieve well-being with economic growth? I think this is the big um, change of paradigm. We need to better understand that it, the economic growth we have today, first, empirically, it's, it's easy to show that it has been decoupled from main measures of living standards, let it be, you know, well-being, health and education, those do not correlate with GDP growth after a certain point. That's So you're not going to get extra well-being uh, if you boost GDP. The second point is even more worrying, is that actually you may get less well-being. For example, now since Thomas Piketty, we know very well that uh, further economic growth in early industrialized nation translates into wider inequality. And we know, of course, for uh, a swath of other scientists that wider inequalities translate into lower levels of, of well-being and welfare in general. So now we need to be aware that we can get GDP growth that is sometimes not creating as much jobs as we want we wanted to create, that is just distracting from uh, well-being in general. And, and that is just um, th th this regardless of the environmental situation. So that will be my great question. Now we are often pitting like, okay, well, we have this environmental limits, but we need economic growth. So how do we reconcile? Let's talk also about social limits, because if we realize that the further pursuit of economic growth and certain regions of the world that are already affluent is futile, then we don't even need to do this. And that's important because then we can realize that by further, you know, logics of downshifting and sufficiency in regions that already have the means to satisfy their needs, we can create more climate space for other regions of the world to find ways, of course, self-determined ways for them to satisfy their needs. Thank you. Yes, you you raise questions of after a certain threshold, um, it doesn't necessarily provide more happiness. You mentioned the point that economic growth is also linked to raising um, inequalities, at least uh, on a global level. And sorry, by the way, my neighbors just started renovating. I'm so sorry if it's noisy. <laughs> Home office. Um, Retrofitting. We all have. We all we all have the same struggles in these pandemic times. So um, I was gonna um, go like towards that topic of, of climate justice and looking into um, yeah less developed countries in in, in a, if we want to use that term in the global south and their performance um, and talking about climate finance as well um, on that international um, debating table so maybe uh, Francois you can also comment on that um, and I just wanted to raise that um, there was a recent study by the Stockholm Environment Institute in Oxfam that um, looked at these carbon inequalities and they found that the richest 10% accounted for over half of the emissions added to the atmosphere in the past 25 years and the richest 1% were responsible for 15% of the emissions more than twice um, that of the poorest half of humanity so how 
can we make sense of that? How can we address these carbon inequalities, both within Europe, but also worldwide in these COP negotiations? And that question goes to, I guess, Francois, and then also Molly as a finance expert. Sure. Well, this is something that we have known for, for quite a long time. And uh, and obviously, it is good that the, the Oxfam report puts figures on it. Uh, I would say we have known, obviously, that the richer, the wealthiest countries were bearing the brunt of the responsibility, but also that within these countries, the wealthiest segments of the population uh, were the most responsible. And, and indeed, this leads us to a question about uh, development also. And if more people become wealthier in the future, which I guess can be an objective in terms of development uh, for the poorest countries, that would also mean that they would produce more emission, uh, which means that we need to come with more equitable uh, solution and with a more equitable alloca allocation of, of the carbon budget. Uh, this is a new aspect and this is a key novelty that will be touched upon in the upcoming IPCC report, which is due to be uh, published in 2022, um, we'll be looking not only at how um, climate change affects and, exas and, and exacerbates inequalities, but perhaps most importantly, we will be looking how climate policies can also exacerbate inequalities. And in a way, how mitigation and adaptation solutions can exacerbate inequalities within countries. Uh, if I can just give one example here, um, we'll have in Europe electric cars uh, who will be coming and flooding the market within the next three or five years. Uh, we know that these electric cars are extremely expensive at the moment, which means that only uh, the wealthiest in the population will be able to afford electric cars. And on the other hand, the, the poorest in the population who will need to continue to drive if they don't have access to public transport, most likely will continue to rely on, uh, on fuel-powered cars, uh, which means that they will be polluting more than those driving electric cars, for example. And I'm not discussing the conditions of the production of the electric cars here. I'm just using this as an example. And if we put in place regulations that ban fuel port cars in cities, that means that only the wealthiest will be able to afford driving in the future. Same for plane. Uh, within, I guess, about 10 years, we'll have hydrogen port planes, but we cannot expect airlines to replace the entirety of their fleet within 10 years, which means that we will have, at the same time, hydrogen port planes, but also gas oil port planes. And most likely, the tickets uh, and the fares to fly it in the former will be more expensive than to fly in the latter, which means that the rich will have the possibility to fly with a reduced carbon footprint, whereas the poor, if they want to fly as well, will need to basically fly with a higher carbon footprint. And I think this is an extremely important dimension to consider, that we often consider the impact of climate change on inequalities, but it is also crucial to consider the impact of climate policies themselves on inequalities. Uh, and we will need to come up with uh, a, a policy package that guarantees a more equitable allocation of emissions and of impacts and also of the impacts of these policies. Anything that will not be equitable will not be efficient. So there's a lot of things tied up in that. Um, but just to say your framing of possible policies are all within a market understanding and obviously as greens we can also move outside the market so for example um if we increase a carbon tax i agree that would affect the poor so we would have to pay a dividend to the poor as i said but we're, we're also in a position where we could introduce rationing of very highly um carbon intensive goods so for example we could say um we give you a permit to fly once a year if you're a business person we don't think it's actually good for you to fly to abu dhabi every week if you're a, an aid worker, perhaps we think it is fine for you to fly to Uganda or Malaysia or somewhere. Um, but if you're an academic, no, you can do your conference by Zoom. You know, we, we are governing in a way that needs to protect future generations. We can take radical steps like that beyond the market understanding, I think. It's not just about price. It could be about deliberate decisions and rationing. Then, uh, you know, on the electric cars, just very briefly, uh, we've already seen that the... 
uh, what we need to make batteries for cars comes, I, I believe, from the Congo anyway, from countries. Yeah, that as I say, I was just using this as an example. Past, I know so, very well that you know, we electric cars are dirty. That we yeah, but that's really the point. Monitor supply chains. You can come back when I've finished. I'm still chatting for a bit. Um, so, you know, we we have to take into account that we don't continue to exploit countries that we've previously exploited to, to take their resources. But just coming back to um, Lisa's question about climate finance, um, I would say this is a double edged sword or a double sided coin or something, because, yeah, sure. It's a good sign that big finance is moving out of fossil fuels and towards um, renewables and towards uh, the green transition. And we've seen recently uh, the fall in the oil stock price, which, to be honest, I've been hoping for much sooner. And uh, But we do want a steady fall because we don't want a sort of financial crisis. And so the signalling is obviously better. And I think this comes back to some of the things that Francois was saying about the, the commitments now from Japan and South Korea and China. And, you know, there's a very clear signal that we are taking climate change seriously and financiers are responding. That's the positive bit. But the negative bit is that they're working out how to make a profit from the policies we need to introduce to tackle climate change. And, you know, um, if we allow that to happen without any constraint, then we will see, we, even if we, we do what we need to do to tackle climate change, we're going to see greater inequality at the end of it. So I think as Greens, we have to take that part very seriously. And that's why I bring in my proposal for reparations and for serious transfers of cash from the countries that have previously exploited um, people and their environments in the uh, majority world and that we don't just go into another round of exploitation because if climate finance ends up with uh, you know pension fund holders and finance houses in the west buying parts of um, the environments of the majority world countries in order to offset or you know take account for our climate emissions then it's effectively just a different version of all that colonial exploitation and that's why I think we have to we have to make that connection as Greens and then reverse it and say, no, instead of that, what we're going to do is use our wealth and power to support you, exactly as Timothy said, to avoid that kind of dirty, um, miserable bit of being an industrialised and post-industrialised society and move into the green economy of the future direct. We'll give you the technology for free to do that. We'll support you financially to do that. And this is, a, it's, to me, it's a propo proposal that isn't finished yet, but I think this kind of ideological framing is the only way of achieving real climate justice. Mina, what does climate justice um, mean for you? And how have you mobilized also in, on the international level, preparing for COP26, um, keeping in mind yeah, these notions of climate justice and what would be your concrete you know, policy proposals when it comes to the European Commission and the recovery funds and climate finance? Difficult questions. Difficult questions, yes. I think to start with COP26 and FYG's hope for Glasgow, um, our plans are to make sure that a lot of young people will be able to be there. And um, we, will, we will organize with other movements who will be there with the other civil society, with other young people, not just from the Young Greens, to make sure that the decision makers are locked in until they come up with ambitious and accountable uh, just climate action targets. And so we really see the strength of the youth climate movement in um, just being loud and vocal and, and stubborn um, because enough is enough and, and, and this, is, this is about us and this is for us. And I think I want to kind of, we've, we've touched upon and I think what, what Molly was saying was really resonating with, with a lot of the thinking that we see beyond just discussions on climate, but around um, this when we discuss colonialism and what can we do about that, it, it's also something that resonates for me as, as an LGBT activist. And I kind of want to, uh, and I will be linking that to Timothy's point on like joie de vivre and like having a good life. And, and so I think as an LGBTI movement, we are resilient. And I hope that a climate movement can take from that resilience and understand how to use resilience. And that resilience comes from solidarity. And it comes from understanding that there are many different struggles. But it's when we work together and when we, and when we come together as one movement that we can really start to overcome them. 
It's resilience that comes from years and years and years and years of being told that we don't exist or that our voices are not valid or that you know we're not invited to tables of decision making and politics. And so you make your own thing work. And so I think this is what we see a lot of the time with young people. You just do your own thing at the end of the day. And, and, and I think this is causing a lot of stress actually on young people because it's like no matter how much we do in terms of individual actions, we know that's never enough. Because as you were saying earlier, the richest 1% have 15% of the emissions. So no matter how many young people are going to get out there using public transport, refusing to get driving license, on bikes, um, walking places, taking trains across Europe, taking buses across Europe, despite the fact that it's, it's really inconvenient, particularly for those of us from islands or rural areas, doing all of this and making our own system and living in our own world, um, uh, knowing that it's going to take time until this becomes something that more people see as as the way to go and and so i think it's um yeah so i said i would bring this back to like a good life and 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 i find it really weird sometimes i speak to other young people who are not connected to the greens and they don't understand why we campaign for like a good life and one with less work hours and more free time and, and one where universal basic income can allow us to be creative and do what we want or do care work and do work that we that that is actually contributing to our local communities and where we can feel passionate and and and, and good about ourselves and i think a good life is also something that as an lgbt activist i really like strive for as well um one where you know you're not limited within a system of or society that is telling you like this is how you have to live these are the norms this is the path that you have to follow and and we're seeing so many young people that we no longer have a path. You no longer get into a job and you're in that job for 20 years or your whole life. I've changed job like so many times in the past five years. You change your course of life so often. And, and, and we kind of want to enjoy this uncertainty and kind of find the joy in uncertainty and not be stressed out. Um, so, um, yeah. So we're we we're pushed to believe like that individual action matters that young people should just try harder and do better on this kind of individual level and we start to realize that all of this has been bullshit and which is why we come together and we and we continue to fight together and we learn from other movements and we learn about anti-racism from the black lives matter movement and we learn about queer rights and human rights and feminism from feminist and queer movements and then we learn about the need to bring this all together as a systemic issue and to confront it as a systemic issue from green movements and green leaders and green politics. And, and I, I really feel that that's the direction that the youth movement is going in. And, and these connections that we bring together are so important. And at the end of the day, hopefully with this fight and this resilience and also celebrating small victories along the way, um, we'll be able to have like that good life at the end or, a good life will be there for someone in the end. And and I, I really hope, you know, that less work, better quality of life, universal basic income, all can come together as part of a just transition. Um and 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 to yeah, for us to thrive. And that's to take Timothy's words. Like we've grown enough and now it's time to thrive and, and we're in that Thank transitionary you. space and that where we're thank, you. Um, thank you. If you're okay with that, um, I will take that as a, as a final statement from your side, Mina. That was very like visionary. I would like now now I like to give the floor once more to um, the other panelists for like a short final statement. You can react to what you've heard. You probably took notes on what you still wanted to say. So please um, be concise, and I will reverse the order. So Tim, you will go first, um, and uh, Leonore will have the final words at the end. Um, so please, is there anything that you would like to react on in particular? One specific thing, we're talking a lot about carbon and carbon neutrality and, and carbon safe. And it's, it's, we need to understand that, um, there's not only carbon. So if we solve, you know, the, the problem of climate change, there will still be some couplings having to do with material footprint, couplings having to do with, or impact on biodiversity. 
So we, we need to really have a, an ecological in the sense of holistic understanding of, of the type of impact our market activities have. Otherwise, imagine all the effort we've had to, 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 to reach that kind of uh, climate agreement, all those little small victories. And then we reach the point where finally we've managed to kind of reduce carbon emissions and realize, oh, but now it's it's about like you know extraction of a specific uh, metal, or it's about you know land land use change and and the impact on specific species. So I think as we're gathering political momentum for climate change, it's very important to use that momentum to cover all the other different environmental impact. This is I, I'm saying this in the context of decoupling too, because you know decarbonizing the economy is is not enough. We really need economies that are embedded sustainably into natural ecosystems and the sense of living in harmony with them. So I, if that can be my last point, I'll be happy with that. Thank you, that was, that was very clear. clear. That was very clear. Um, François Gemene, anything in particular? Yes, we also sure. had one question about um, Russia, whether you could briefly comment on the role of Russia, but that might go too far. Yeah, uh, I'll start with Russia. I would say that Russia has uh, has been having the same attitude of the United States, but more hypocritical, that is, that Russia has done nothing, but it has stayed in the Paris Agreement without meeting any of its commitments. So in a way, it would have been more candid if Russia had also exited the Paris Agreement. Um, and, and that's been the case, I mean, since Vladimir Putin is in power. So since 1999, I think that he has been following all climate negotiations more than any other leader, with the exception of maybe a few African dictators. Um, no, um, as a final statement, um, my job as a scientist is to document the way populations in the global south are affected, uh, displaced because of the impacts of climate change. And this is something that is happening right now. And I feel that sometimes we focus too much on future generations and too much on ourselves. Uh, and I think that we should not forget that the goal of all this is to keep the planet inhabitable for the most vulnerable amongst humanity. And those most vulnerable are not in the wealthy Europe, even though there are vulnerable people in Europe as well, but there are in the global south. And, and I've heard a lot of things that were about the reinvention of our societies, reimagining the economy. Um, I think that's at the risk of something like the awful pragmatic guy here, I think we need to focus on where we have some kind of democratic majority at the moment. That doesn't mean that we cannot pursue other objectives, but we need to work on what works right now and what will keep the planet inhabitable for the most vulnerable inhabitants. If this allows us to live better and to live a better life, well, that's a collateral benefit. But that shouldn't be the goal, and the goal should really be uh, to keep the planet inhabitable for those who are the most vulnerable. And I think that we shouldn't forget uh, that goal in the reinvention of our societies. Thank you so much, François Gemene. Um, so Molly, any reactions to that? I'm sure that you have some Well, I would say that ones. as Greens, the most important thing we should push for during this COP year is a strong and rising carbon tax with a dividend, because it's the most effective way from an economic point of view of putting the right incentive into the market and getting those powerful markets working for us. Um, but taking up Francois's challenge, I, I totally agree. You know, people are suffering from the effects of climate change today. And that is a consequence of what we as Europeans did in the past and, and the US. You know, the countries that have burned a lot of fossil fuels in the past are responsible for that suffering. And that's why I think as Greens, we could do something really interesting, you know, tying that loss and damage sort of proposal that will be the discussion that will be happening at the COP to the, the question of um, past abuses by our countries and the need to atone and make reparations for those. And finally, I would just say that um, it's true that we're suffering a lot less in most of our countries at the moment, but we still, we're democracies and we will have to persuade people that this climate change uh, policy is good for them. And I think that's uh, why I value what Timothy is doing. And we, we're trying to come up with slogans in the UK Green Party at the moment, like, you know, T-shirts saying 1.5% is good for you. I don't think that's a good slogan. But, you know, basically what we need to do to address the climate crisis is going to make us better and happier societies. And as Greens, <laughs> who are going to stand for election, we do have to have a message like that so that we can actually put our stronger policies around climate reparations and a carbon tax actually into practice in government. 
Thank you. And yes, talking about finding democratic majorities and dealing with the realities of the political um, daily lives. Uh, the final words go to Ministry Leona Revesla, and we have one comment also that I would like to read out. Um, Greens in government uh, in the EU are in, in, in six governments. Yes, we have to assume that on one hand, Green ministers are satisfied with the reduction of at least 55% in the European Council and that the European Greens won between 60% and 65%. Um, so, yeah, last comments on the political realities of these climate policies, please. I will uh, still pick up a bit from what Francois said um, for the final statement. Um, but first, as a general message, um, picking up from what many of you said, I think international climate finance, our solidarity on on um, on the international field needs to dramatically uh, improve and be scaled up. On um, so that that's a starting point. Um, but in general, the transformation that we have in front of us as societies, as countries, as political actors to reach the climate neutrality goal is on the one hand, and that comes from this discussion also much bigger than just um, the focus on the environmental boundaries and the focus on, on, on CO2 emissions. But without the focus on CO2 emissions, um, we will have a completely different situation, a completely different transformation in front of us with large parts on our, on our planet uninhabitable. So I think we really need to to um, to make sure that that we um, that we act on these priorities, and that uh, we make sure that in acting, we have in mind that climate policy is more than environmental policy. And I think this equity discussion. I would love to continue this with with Francois on an, on another uh, on another occasion because we are we are. Um, what we're doing right now in, 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 every, in every instrument, we do support instruments, for example, for renovation. We, we completely reshuffle them in a way that for uh, people on the lower end of the income scale, we basically will uh, need to provide instruments that cover uh, basically 100% of the investment cost. So how do, you, how do you reshuffle also public policy? How do you reshift tax policy so that those who consume more CO2 pay a fair share also in this. So, I mean, there's there is a lot of work to do. There is so much you can do in, in climate policy. Uh, and we try to mainstream this really into this thinking into every single policy area we develop. But we also need to be sure we have, um, we have all the other political actors uh, and all the other ministries on board because this transformation to a climate uh, neutral society is as much a task for our Ministry of Labor as for our Ministry of Economy, as for the industry strategy, as for uh, for the uh, university. Uh, uh, the, the, what do we train people on? What's, I mean, a hundred million questions. So um, I think what, um, and, and we are working on all of this at the moment. And I think this is, this is really, um, this is really my, um, my, um, call to action maybe at the end yeah that uh, I think it's it's really important while keeping the different um, angles of what can greens in government do what can greens uh, in in the in at the different levels in government or outside of government as political actors as actors in the, the civil society sphere do but let's not forget while we might have different roles we share the same struggle we share the same political goal we want to move forward and i think that's very important to keep in mind in our debates also internally that the more cohesive we are in also respecting the different roles the more powerful will be to move ahead because we need majorities democratic majorities in the different kind of, of governments, in the different kind, but also in, in terms of, of, of people support on our side. So the stronger we are in fighting this together in our different roles and responsibilities, the, the, the more uh, we'll move ahead in, in the biggest challenge of our time to fight the climate crisis. And I think this is a, is a historic task, but it's our task to take because nobody else will be able to do this. And I think this is the, this is the, the, um, 
this is what unites us and I think this is what we need to fight for. Um, Thank you so get. much. These were just uh, perfect final words. I will not add on to um, any of that because time is running out. Thank you so much to all our panelists for having taken the time and for your precious insights. That was really um, great. Thank you so much for um, all the, the, the audience that were joining in. Um, I hope that we can now walk the talk and all work together for um, yeah, more ambitious policies, also to not only um, target-wise, but also implementation-wise. And um, just uh, one heads up, there, is, uh, another, there are two other parallel sessions after this one, so you can just stay on the platform. Uh, one starting now um, with representatives of the Glasgow Agreement, so they will share um, how their climate action plan and what's um, civil society can do against climate change without waiting for governments and institutions to act. And at um, two, we also have the mock COP um, outcomes uh, presentation. So the first ever online youth climate conference. So um, just stay on the plot platform. And thanks again for everyone. Have a great day. And Mary